high places, going up to the high places, going up to the high places, tear the devil's king down. Going up to the high places, going up to the high places, going up to the high places, tear the devil's king down. By the devil too long, we're gonna tear the devil's kingdom down. But he says, the devil too long, we're gonna tear the devil's kingdom down. Going up to the high places, going up to the high places, going up to the high places. Places going up to the high places, going up to the high places, turn the devil's king. We gotta be bold, we gotta be bold, we gotta be bold. We're gonna tear the devil's king down. We're gonna reclaim everything the devil's stole. We're gonna tear the devil's kingdom down. As the coming of the Lord, as the coming of the Lord draws near, get ready to meet the King. He's coming in a cloud from heaven. He's coming back again. And with a shout, it will be said in power and glory. As the coming of the Lord draws near, get ready to meet the King. The saints will shout amen, amen. as we meet him in the air. The saints will shout amen. amen. Jesus Christ is coming back again. Oh, as the coming, as the coming of the Lord draws near. Oh, yes, he's coming in a cloud of heaven. He's coming back again with a shout will be said in power and glory. As the coming of the Lord draws near, get ready to meet the King. And the saints will shout Amen. As we meet Him in the air, the saints will shout Amen. Jesus Christ is coming back. Oh, Jesus Christ. Yes, Jesus Christ is coming back. Oh, make him war. Making war in the heavenly. Tearing down principalities. Standing firm in Jesus' victory. That exalts itself against the knowledge of God. We do not bow. We do not bow our knees to the Prince of the Air. We know that truth has set us free. Oh, thank you, Lord. Under our feet, He will surely be crushed. Standing firm in Jesus' victory, making war in the heavenly, casting down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Our hearts are set apart for the courts of the Lord. His 
church Sunday night. We're going to keep on moving. Sing this song in the secret. In the secrets, in the quiet place. Church, hallelujah. Amen. As we slow things down in an attitude of worship and we raise our hands and we close our eyes, I'd like to remind you, my friend, you are saved by grace. And you have a strength, you have a refuge that comes from on high. No matter where you go, no matter how far you are, you can always look up to the heavens and pray to God, and he will be your refuge and your strength. So we're going to worship God. We're going to sing this song, You Are My Refuge and Strength.
more time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. a declaration of 
a praise and worship unto God. Amen. Thank God for his faithfulness. You know, it's it's so nice to gather together, you know, with other like-minded men and women. But, you know, I don't know how many times I'm by myself and I'm worshiping God, man. I mean, I, I'm worshiping God with you tonight. It's a joy to worship God with the people of God. Amen. But how many of you know our, our, our worship is not just confined to this building? And so it don't matter, you know, where you're at, you know, driving down the road, the highways, you know, it don't matter. You know, God is it's worthy to be praised. Amen. We want to go before the Lord tonight, and we want to remember to pray for David Lee for his salvation, Pam Rice for healing the Brown family, the Alexander family for salvation, Trish, Kim, I need a miracle. Uh, we want to pray for Emily and their family for their salvation, Adam, Abel, Isaac, amen, that God would work, that God would uh, draw upon them, that whole family, amen, and so also as well, we want to remember to pray for the newlyweds as they're struggling on their way to Cancun, Mexico. You know, it's a dirty job. Somebody has to do it. You understand that, amen, and so what a wonderful, wonderful service that we have this morning, amen, and just uh, literally, you know, we can celebrate because it is truly the fruit of all of our labors. That's a family experience, what we were so privileged to see and be a part of, and so we want to pray God's speed, God's blessing to them. Uh, also, as well, many people are traveling, going back to the cities where they came from, and so we want to remember to pray tonight for traveling mercies for them. I would i uh, like to remember to pray for our uh, spiritual leaders, amen, Pastor Greg and Lisa, amen, thank God that uh, they stand uh, They stand in the gap for us, uh, absolutely no beyond a shadow of a doubt, any kind of a need, amen, we have leadership, amen, that uh, we have good leadership, and so it's so great to know, and so we want to pray for them, we want to remember to pray for our president, praying for our nation, praying for our soldiers also as well we want to uh, continue to pray I mean, there's uh, two churches that are represented on the platform tonight uh, two ministries in Grapevine Texas and Conway South Carolina and so our prayers we are vested in that we have a vested vested interest in these two cities and just really excited about what God is going to do and so we want to pray God's speed God's favor to them and so, please, if you would, once again, uh, lift up your needs, amen, before the Lord. Believe God that he is our provider, that he's Jehovah Jireh, our provision, our abundance. And so let's lift up these needs and believe God for that. And uh, as we subside, my brother Mark, please, if you would open this service in a word of prayer, amen. Join with me as we pray and call out to God tonight.
Praise God. Would you turn and greet one another before you're seated? Amen. The Lord bless you. So good to see you out in church tonight. Oh, God. 
sing special music it seems like seems like I, I asked him to, to sing a solo tonight and so but we do want to keep our crowd so let's get a report let's get a report and so uh, uh, most of you are all aware uh, several conferences ago we uh, give them the opportunity and I just tell our young couples you know do you have a burden of do you have a particular place that that you want to go to? And so what they want to do is they, they feel that God has called them to pastor. And then I said, what kind of burden? Where do you want to go? And so um, what we did is after a period of time, amen, we came to the conclusion of going to, going to Texas. And then finally from Texas, it was in Grapevine. And so his uh, wife and his uh, beautiful family have landed there in Grapevine, Texas. And so I've asked him to come and give a report of all that God's doing in Grapevine. So let's welcome Brother Richard as he comes tonight. So pastor heard my brother sing this morning and he told me, he said, we've already heard one Herline saying no more. But this feels really familiar. I did this every single week, come up here and give a report for who knows how long. And then about eight or nine months ago, pastor said, uh, I'm tired of hearing reports, so he sent me on an outreach to Dallas. <sighs> okay. I got a long report, and so I, I skipped eight months of reporting, and so I got about eight months worth of reports to give you. The first report, we landed there, and uh, right in the boom of when everybody was moving to Dallas, or Texas, and you couldn't find a place to rent. When you did find a place to rent, the rent was outrageous. You know, like a one-bedroom apartment was like $2,200 rent. If you wanted a two- or a three-bedroom apartment, it was about twenty-five to twenty-seven. dollars And if you wanted a house, you're looking over three grand. And so we spent about a week uh, driving around, and we couldn't find anything. And so I, we, I was so tired from looking at houses. Uh, me and Herschel were driving in the neighborhood. We pulled over just to take a little break, give our minds a rest. And uh, I looked to my left, and I saw an empty house. The windows were wide open, so you can tell it was empty. And so I was like, I'm going to go check this house out. I walk up. I look through it, and indeed it was empty. And I was like, perfect. Now I just need to find out who owns this place. So I get on Google, and I, I look for the owner, and I can't find anything. And so as we pull away, I put the, par put the car in drive. I pull up off the road, and the neighbor pulls in their driveway. And I was like, screw it. Let's go talk to him. I walked, I was like, forget it, let's go talk to him. <laughs> it's been a while. And so <laughs> I walk up and I say, excuse me, sir, do you know who owns this house? I would like to rent it. And he goes, I own this house. And I was like, amen. And he says, but I don't want to rent it to you. And I said, oh, dang. Well, do you know of anywhere else around the area we can rent from? And he says, come inside. I walk inside and he had just remodeled the very next door house. And he said, I was just about to list this tomorrow. And I said, sir, don't list it. We'll take it. How much do you want? And it's, it's a house, three bedroom house, about 1600 square feet. And so I was, I was bracing myself and he says, we'll give it to you for 1850. So thank God that was the first miracle that when we got there, housing was scarce and it still is scarce, but God opened a door, literally opened a door, a neighbor walked out and we got the house and we're still there to this day. Uh, we, uh, as soon as we got there, I had this vision of for how it should be played out. And I told God, this is how it's going to play out. I was going to be the youngest Billy Graham in Dallas. And God said, Sh no, it's not happening. But we outreached our butts off for the first month. And we, let's be honest, we didn't see one visitor the first month. And then my wife witnessed to a girl named Sheila. And uh, turns out they, her and her husband had just moved to Dallas from Kansas. They had just graduated college from Kansas. 
the husband was coming to be a doctor. He was going to med school in Dallas, and she was just taking care of their kids. They had just got there, and uh, Sheila and her son uh, locked in. They didn't miss a single Bible study, a single service for the next three months. That's a miracle number two. And then about a month or so into it, we're like, hey, uh, you play guitar, right? She joined our song service. And so, amen. Pray for Sheila. Pray for Omar. Uh, they're a walking miracle, and so we'd like to see what God can do with them, and hopefully we'll see them in July. So that was miracle number two. And then fast forward about two or three months from us being there, Thanksgiving hit. We outreached for it, and uh, we hit the streets. We passed out. I think me and my wife passed out. Oh, and Sheila and Omar, they go on impact teams with us to other cities. So amen. But anyways, uh, it's been a while. So we, uh, we outreached for Thanksgiving, and um, we saw seven visitors come into our house for our Thanksgiving Bible study. Amen. The first lady who walked in, my wife met at uh, the Walmart parking lot. She uh, got a flyer. She came in. Her name's Rosa. She's an older Mexican lady. And I shook her hand as she walked in our door. And I kid you not, about 15 seconds later, she's cooking in our kitchen. Can you say amen? Literally, hello, how nice to meet you. And she went and started cooking. Didn't say a word. She just started cooking. I said, we're having revival. <laughs> The uh, another couple walked in for our Thanksgiving, and um, they came, enjoyed our Bible study, and then as they were about to leave, I'm, I'm going to be I'm, I'm being honest, they invited me to their own Bible study. <laughs> so I thank God for visitors, but <laughs> moving on. <laughs> a couple months later, our Christmas came up. Uh, we had a couple of churches in the area come help us. We outreached like crazy. We rented a room on downtown Main Street, Grapevine. And uh, for that uh, Christmas service, we had 11 visitors come. Amen. Which is crazy, crazy that me and my wife and uh, we got 11 people here. And we're just from Bullhead and we're in Dallas, Grapevine doing it. Amen. And so Christmas, we had 11 visitors. And just an interesting side note, uh, um, a gentleman came. He brought his family. And he says, oh, have you ever seen The Chosen? And I was like, yes, I'm very familiar with The Chosen. Oh, well, I'm one of the directors. I direct the special effects on it. So it, Dallas uh, is a hub. There's many people there. They filmed The Chosen right there, about 45 minutes from my house. So that was very interesting. Christmas was great. And uh, we want to say thank you to Denton because they came and helped us out for that. Again, we saw 11 visitors. Now, we live in Dallas, or Grapevine. Uh, Dallas is huge. And so they have about 20 churches there from our fellowship. And um, in, in the month of February, for some reason, everybody decided to have revival. Me and my wife and my family, we were in church for over 18 straight days. We were in a church service. <laughs> we were having conference after conference after conference after revival. And you think you'd get burned out. And, and, and we did get burned out, but not from the preaching, not from the preaching, from the out of, from the eating. We would have to go out to eat every night, and as you can tell, I brought back more of myself, and so. <laughs> so it's just awesome being in Dallas. I do want to encourage, um, we have people that eventually are going to pastor here in this church, or go pastor again, and we came to Dallas. We didn't know how lucky we got, but having 20 fellowship churches within an hour's drive of you, the strengthening, the support that they offer, I encourage you, I mean, come to Dallas or go somewhere there is a lot of fellowship churches because that we wouldn't be half as uh, <laughs> excited as we were if we didn't have that support from the, the other 20 churches. And so I encourage you, come to Dallas. I already got cities picked out. Come talk to me. We'll, uh, we'll get it. All right, let's fast forward now. Uh, about a month ago, we started, getting, we started feeling the need to get into a building. Our living room is awesome, but I'm tired of preaching on couches. And so, uh, <laughs> and so we decided to start looking for a building, and we found a building. Well, first of all, let's backtrack. Buildings... You think houses are expensive. Buildings are insane. In Texas, they don't have any taxes, but what they do is they tax everything, including property tax, which is insane, and the renter pays for that. So you're looking for like a thousand foot square building, about four grand, which is insane. It's insane. And so we had been looking for buildings the entire time we were there, no favor, no open doors. And then I, uh, I was talking to another pastor in an area. He's like, go find yourself an Indian man. He'll rent to you no matter what. And so I'm driving down the street, and I see an Indian food store on a strip mall, and I was like, <laughs> I pulled into the shopping center, and I walked down the strip mall, and of course, there is a for sale, or a for lease sign in one of the buildings, um, and I call the number, it's an older Indian man, I said, thank you, Jesus, hey, check this out, so four grand is like the least amount we've been quoted so far, 
he said, you can have it for 1400 flat. <laughs> Insane. That's, that's a miracle. That's God right there. So we signed the lease. We get the keys. We're about to have Easter service there. And then the city was like, um, let me take a chunk. And so some things happened and the city wasn't, we didn't want to play ball. And so fortunately the, the land or the owner, he understood what was going on. And unfortunately we had to withdraw from that lease. But we, uh, that was Easter weekend. So we, we decided to have Easter in the park. And we, uh, Denton again came down, helped us outreach. We had seven people saved that Saturday. And then on that Sunday morning, it was supposed to rain. We had our service from 10 till about 11, 30, 12 on the flyer. The forecast said rain from 10 to 12. And so Jonathan was like, or sorry, Pastor Lovato was like, hey, it's going to be raining. So we both were like, all right, let's just pray. And so I woke up Sunday morning. First thing I did, check the weather forecast. No rain, and it didn't rain at all the entire night, or entire day. We saw about, so we had 11 visitors, and another pastor drove in from uh, his city and came, and he just was there. And so 11 visitors, and this was the insane thing about it. We, Dallas and Texas, there's no uh, shortage of people who love going to church. Going to church is the religion. And so we have had many visitors. I think over the past eight months, there's been about 50 people that have come through our Bible study. So we have no shortage of visitors. What we do have a shortage of is people that get converted in a radical conversion. And so we've been praying for that. And so what had happened was we, when we first got there and we were outreaching, my wife met a girl named Rose. And her husband is named Anthony. <laughs> and so what had happened is invited her out, never heard from her. And about six months later, she called my wife up and said, are you guys still doing that church thing? And <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Jesus hasn't come yet, so we're still here. And uh, she's like, I want to come to church. She wants to come to church more than we do. <laughs> Again, it's been a long time. That's not true. We love going to church. But she comes every single time. She was unemployed. Her husband had just got laid off. And uh, she had to go to work to pay the bills. And she got a job. And we were like, yes. And then she told us, but guess what? I told my boss, I'm not working on Wednesday. I'm not working on Sunday. We didn't tell her that. That's a miracle. She gets it. She got radically converted, what we're looking for. Her name is Rose. Husband's name Anthony. You can't forget that. Pray for them. And tell Rose and Anthony, thank you. <laughs> I do want to say one thing. Um, Dallas, I've already said this, but Dallas is wide open. You guys, when we do have a building, you're going to come for an impact team, please. And we thank you guys for that. And we always hear you guys praying for us. That really does encourage us. But Dallas is wide open, Texas is wide open, and we want some more friends. 20 churches isn't enough. So I encourage you, if you guys want to get sound, and, and I'm not saying it's easy. To, in fact, this is the hardest that we've ever had to work at anything in our lives. But it's fulfilling, and you have a purpose. More than, I come, We came to Outreach every single week here, and amen for that. And thank you guys for showing up to the Outreach. I'm sure the Outreach leader thanks you guys too. But when you get out there and you realize that it's all on your shoulders, you realize how much every individual soul matters, and they do. Any person that walks through that door matters immensely especially when you're just fighting for somebody besides your wife to get saved every sunday <laughs> but i encourage you come to dallas we'd love to see you there thank you very much thank you pastor thank you guys for praying i appreciate it praise god appreciate that tonight amen we're uh man where do you go uh when uh, my wife and I came to Bullhead some 35, 40 years ago, there was a young man in the church, a young bachelor in the church. And, and just from the very beginning, from the very beginning, you could just literally see, I mean, uh, you could just literally see the hand of God on him. Uh, great quality young man in the church. We're talking about John Paul's father. And uh, we just begin to pastor and see what God's doing and then we we saw Normie come into the church Normie and her sister they came in with the church and uh, you know and then through the process of time you know they started dating and they started getting married and you know it's just the way of the world and and then they started having children and uh, just always they always had a heart for God uh, John married wonderfully, married a wonderful, wonderful woman. John and Norman Burles, pastor in Myrtle Beach. And what they've done is they have just been such a fantastic example to their sons and daughters. And um, all I want to say is it's just such a privilege what you've just seen, you don't see happen everywhere. 
And so what you saw is you saw a young man give his report. His dad is a pastor. And now what you're about to see is a young man stand and preach the gospel, and his dad is a pastor. It's just something that's been passed down from father to son, from one generation to the next. And so uh, we love John Paul. We love Sarah. We're excited about this first page of ministry in their book, Pastoring in Conway, South Carolina. Uh, they're young. They're strong. And how many of you know we're expecting wonderful, wonderful things? And so it's good to have them here tonight. Let's give John Paul a great big God bless you as he comes. <laughs> specifically this church. Um, we were, I was blessed and privileged to be able to marry Sarah here in this church five years ago, just a couple of days ago. But I want to say thank you to, you know, there's some of you that have been here for many years and you knew my dad at a young age. My dad's told me countless of stories of Mr. Miller and his times with him. And so my point is I want to say thank you, though, for all the years that you guys invested in my dad. Understand that when you guys invested in him, help raise him into a young disciple what it created is it it created a father that was able to disciple me i'm grateful for that i really am i really do when i extend that gratefulness but praise god we're going to preach so if you've got your bibles tonight um if you can turn to the book of habakkuk chapter one we're going to read a few verses there and then i'm going to jump to chapter three and catch a couple verses there i'll be entirely honest with you i really don't have an intro to this sermon the title of my sermon to, tonight is, is what I've entitled The Love for a Dying Generation. When I read Habakkuk, Habakkuk's just simply three chapters, but what I saw is I saw something very simple play out. And what it was is it was a man of God who was seeing the sin that was going on around him, questioning, God, when are you going to judge? When are you going to set things straight? And then seeing God respond to him, and after responding to him, see a change of heart. One of the things that for us as Christians, especially those of us that have given our lives to Jesus Christ, we've experienced the love of God. It's transforming. It's changed our hearts. One of the things that can happen is, is as we go on in our walk is, is we can see a lack of love within our own hearts towards people. It can be something that's subtle. It can be something that happens over time. But the important thing that we need to have tonight, especially in the day and age that we live in, is we need to have a love for this dying generation. So if you have your Bibles, in the book of Habakkuk, chapter 1, we're going to read the first 11 verses there. Chapter 1, verse 1. The burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry, and you will not hear? Even cry out to you violence, and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity, and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me, where a strife and, conten and contention arises. Therefore, the law is powerless, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, therefore perverse judgment proceeds. And then God responds. In verse 5, look among the nations and watch and be utterly astounded. For I will work a work in your days, which you would not believe, though, I were, uh, though it were told you. For indeed, I am raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty nation, which marches through the breadth of the earth, to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Dreadful, uh, dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity proceed from themselves. Their horses also are swifter than leopards and more fierce than even evening wolves. Their charges charge ahead. Their cavalry comes from afar and they fly as the eagle that hastens to. They all come for violence. Their faces are set like the east wind. They gather captives like sand. They scoff at kings and princes are scorned by them. They deride every stronghold, for they heap up earthen mounds and seize it. Then his mind changes, and he transgresses. He commits offense, ascribing his power to his God. Now jump to chapter 3 of Habakkuk. I'm just going to read the first two verses. A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet of Shigenoeth. O Lord, I have heard your speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. 
in wrath, remember mercy. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I'm asking, God, that tonight you would help me, God, and help us. God, I'm asking, God, that your word as it goes forth, you would stir the hearts of your people. God, cause us, God, to have a heart for people like you have a heart for people. A love for this dying generation, and we're careful to put this time into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. First thing I want to talk about our lack of love. In our text, we see Habakkuk's complaint. Again, he's prophesying in this time where, where it's near the end of the time, the end of Israel's time, where they're you know they're on the cusp of going into captivity, and so he sees the sin that's going on around him. And like any righteous man, he wonders when God is going to set things straight. Right. So his complaint is, "How long can I watch this wickedness?" He says, "God, you've caused me to see iniquity. How long will you let this go on?" As I heard this, I began to hear myself, especially as we see in today, the day that we live in, it's almost like sin is running rampant at a rate that we can't, we can't even fathom. And it's, it's almost like after I got saved and began to see the wickedness, there was a question of, God, you've opened my eyes to all that's going on, but how long are you going to allow it to go on? How long are you going to allow wickedness to prevail? How long are you going to allow sin to run rampant within the hearts of man? And the question of that began to turn into an anger towards what was going on. Because you see, as, as, as we look at our generation, especially for me, I'm young, right? But even in this short adulthood life that I've lived, it's almost like we've seen the move in our nation throughout the world that's incredible. It's almost like as technology has advanced and connected everybody, it's almost like all the demons among people connected worldwide and came together. Pastor Greg Mitchell preached a powerful sermon called The Great Reset. I don't know how many of you listened to it, but he talked about Babylon and all that transpired there and how we're seeing that today. But one of the things that I see is, is that as we begin to see sin and as we begin to see it rampant, what can happen is, is our hearts can begin to lack love towards what's going on. As we see all that transpires, there's an anger that begins to develop within all of us. And so first there's a righteous anger towards sin. But what I'm not going to talk about that. What I'm going to talk about is the anger that goes from an anger towards sin that goes towards an anger towards the sinner. That as we begin to look at people in our lives, whether they're close to us or whether they're people that we begin working with, all of a sudden we begin to have a view towards them that shifts. Now it's no longer explaining to them how much God loves them and cares about them, but it's almost like you take a step back and go, okay, how long is this going to really go on, right? Until God's got to judge it. And it's almost like within our own hearts, we give them up to judgment, right? I mean, if, if we're being entirely honest, how many of you have come across people that you've tried witnessing to? They seem so far gone. And it's almost like there's an ability within us to go, well, I guess hell is your portion. On to the next one. <laughs> Let me tell you what, as, as, as funny as that sounds, the, the incredible thing is the fact that there's still a soul that God created, that God loved. That God has plan and purpose and destiny for. I think of the story of Jonah. Jonah, here's a man who, after he saw what God did for Nineveh, he was angry. I, I kind of laughed at his response. But we see in Jonah chapter 4, verses 1, this is after God has spared Nineveh. Chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from disaster. Here's Jonah. He's like, God, this is the reason why I didn't want to go to Nineveh, because I knew you were gracious. I knew you wouldn't judge. I knew you wouldn't, you know. I Forgive me, I laughed at that, but there's some times where I look at myself and I go, that sounds a lot like you, John Paul. What we see is that we can see a lack of love as we witness as we begin to work with people, there can be a lack of love. How many of you know somebody or are that person that's really good at preaching hell to people, right? The idea that you'd go to their doorstep, you'd knock on their door. Hey, listen, do you know Jesus? No, I don't want him. Okay, you know you're going to go to hell, right? <laughs> Funny story. I don't know how good this is. But I remember I was witnessing to these two young men. And I remember, you know, witnessing to them, bringing them to a place of decision. Hey, listen, after sharing the gospel, do you want to give Jesus your life? And they said, nah, you know, we, we believe, but I don't know about right now. And I said, listen, man, no problem. I get it. You don't want to make that decision right now. 
I'll leave you alone as long as you're okay with understanding that today what you're accepting is you're accepting going to hell. If you're okay with accepting that, because that's what you're... I look back and I look in my heart and I go, what the heck was that, John Paul? Where's the love? Love's lacking here. The preaching of hell was excellent, but let me tell you what, the love was lacking. But the reason why this is important is because when there's a love that's lacking, there's a loss of credibility with those around you, with people that begin to see your life, those that are close to you, that you've been trying to witness to for years, those that are on the streets that watch you and watch your life. When there's a lack of love, there's a, la there's a loss of credibility. They no longer look at you and go, I want what you have, but it's, I don't know if I want that. There's something missing there. There's a key ingredient, a key element that's missing there. And many times it's a lack of love. We've got the words down. We've got the words right. We know how to preach it and say it right. But let me tell you what, when there's a lack of love, there's something lacking incredibly. We see this in, in, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 1. Though I speak with tongues of men and angels, but do not have love, I have, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. What happens is when there's a lack of love, our witness can almost become ineffective. I say almost because there is truth behind the fact that when the gospel goes forth, it's never going to come back void. I understand that. But what happens is when there's a, there's a lack of love, what we can see happen is it's almost like we can offend people. As we begin to, you know, preach, preach to them with, with, without, without love, it's almost like there's a wall that can go up that goes, I hear the right words, but I don't want it. There's a need for love. There's a need of love for sinners. We see our lack of love on a on a personal level. Like I said, as we begin to see, you know, people, um, uh, I remember for me, so I've grown up as a pastor's kid my entire life, right? And as a pastor's kid, you're, you're surrounded with, even though my parents wouldn't share with me the business of what they happened with people in, in the church, um, it, 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 it's not like you could really hide from it, right? I would begin to see people. I'd begin to see people struggle. And what I was guilty of as a young kid being ignorant and not understanding, I would begin to look at people with, with the view of, come on, get it together. Can't you just pull it together? Don't you see that sin's destroying you? It's obvious. We all see it. You're not hiding it from everybody. Just pull it together, right? A complete wrong mindset. But there's something it's almost like we forget as we look at sinners. There's something that we forget. 1 Corinthians chapter 118, For the preaching of the cross to them that perish is foolishness. But unto us which are saved is the power of God. It's almost like we forget that sinners don't understand, that sinners don't know, that sinners don't comprehend. For those that are perishing and on their way to a devil's hell, they are lost, lost in their sin, dead in their sin. What they don't need is they don't need to be necessarily jacked up in that moment. They're already jacked up from the floor up, as my dad would tell me. They need love. The importance of us having a love for people. So, secondly, I want to talk about God's response here. Because God responds by talking about judgment. In our text, God responds by saying he will judge. So in Habakkuk, in the first verse, and so in chapter between 5 and 11, what he talks about is he says, Look among the nations and watch and be utterly astounded for the work I will work in your days, which you, uh, uh, for I will work a work in your days which you would not believe though it were told you. For indeed I am raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty nation, which marches through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. So what we see here is we see God respond to Habakkuk by saying, Listen, I am going to judge. And the judgment that I'm going to bring, you wouldn't believe it if I told you. Because I'm raising up a people that are a bitter people, that are a harsh people, that are a people that are going to bring judgment. God then begins to explain to him, listen, this judgment is real. This judgment is severe. But let me tell you what, what God, what, what God was trying to show him here is the fact that God's judgment, God's judgment is something that we really can't handle even though we, we think it's something we can easily pass along. In our text, God's judgment is for a time right? The Chaldeans would ultimately come in and they would, you know, be, uh, 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 they would oppress the Israelites, but it would be for a time. But my friend, I'm telling you tonight that there's a time of judgment that's coming that'll last for all of eternity. The time of mercy is running out. Very soon here, time will end as we know it. 
where there's no longer going to be hope for another generation, where there's no longer going to be a time for you to be able to repent and make it right, where there's no longer going to be another opportunity for you to share the gospel with somebody and for them to see their need for Jesus Christ. There's a time where we're all going to stand before God. Ultimately, even if we were to all live long, healthy lives, every one of us will step from this life and we'll step into the next. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, and just as is it appointed for man to die once, and then after that comes the judgment, where every one of us will have to stand before God and give an account for our life. Everybody that we talk to and witness to is going to have to stand before God and give an account of their life. And let me tell you what, if, if for, for those that are not you know, not on, uh, not on the right side of this track, if they have not made a decision to give their life to Jesus Christ, the unfortunate thing is the judgment that is going to be upon their life is hell. That is a judgment so severe we don't comprehend it. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. This is, a common, this is a common text, but the wages of our sin is death. For those that are living in sin, and, and this is my quick plug to you, if you're here tonight and you're living a life of sin and you know you're not right with God, let me just say tonight, you need to make it right. Because if you don't, there's a judgment that's coming that will last for all of eternity. It's not a judgment that'll be a slap in the hand or like prison where you go, you think about it, but you have a chance to make it right. This is going to be a judgment that lasts for all of eternity. There's no escaping it. There's no running from it. But understand tonight that this was not God's desire. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9, the Lord is, slow, is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish but that all should come to reach repentance. God's desire is that none of us would go to hell. It's the reason why he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross, so that we can escape that judgment, so that as we stand before God on the day of judgment, what we will be is we will be cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, no longer stained or spotted by sin. That is the beauty of the gospel. God does not desire any of us that we should perish. But the sad truth is, is that there's going to be many that don't make it because hell is a real place where real people are really going to go. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, enter by the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction and there be many that go by it. Question for you, when you look at people as you witness to them, do you look at them with the eyes of what their eternal destination is going to be? As you begin to witness to you, do you look past, past all the crazy things that they say, past all the weird ways that they look, and look deep into their heart and go, where is that soul going? Because that is a soul that was created by God. Just like yours was created by God. Just like God gave you purpose and destiny. God wants to give them the same. Many times it's so easy to look past that. You don't want it? No problem. But how many of us stop to really, to really, Look in there and say, where is that soul going? Do we think about their eternal destiny? The reason why I talk about that is because that's where we see the change of tune in Habakkuk. A transformed heart of love. In our text, I felt the heart of Habakkuk here afterwards when he says, God in wrath, remember mercy. Here's Habakkuk just two chapters earlier. It was God, when are you going to judge things? God lays out what he's going to do as far as judgment. And the next thing you know, Habakkuk says, God in wrath, remember mercy. There's a transformed heart of love when, we, when we're reminded of God's judgment. We don't think about hell often because for those of us that are saved and covered by the blood of Jesus, that doesn't concern us. We know where we're going to go. But let me tell you what, it's a healthy dose of reminding of what hell really is going to be for those that don't make it that can really transform our heart and give us again that heart of love towards people. A love towards people that as we look at them, we can say, you know what? Jesus loves you and he wishes that you don't perish, but that you make heaven your home. This is something that we need to be reminded of. But it's interesting because we see in our text this transformed heart of love that Habakkuk had was after he had this encounter with God where God spoke to him. There's a need for us to have an encounter and to continue to have encounters with God in prayer. You know, the reason why prayer is so important in the morning, a, a healthy life of prayer and reading your Bible is so that our heart doesn't get skewed. 
And for, if, if, and, and for me, I'll be entirely honest with you, you know, as, uh, you know, even as a young disciple, you know, I, I sh one of the things I struggled with early on was a daily Bible reading and prayer. Like, let me tell you what, if you don't do that, it's very, very easy to come to church, be good, feel good, and completely lack the love of, for people. Completely lack it. There's a need to have encounters with God. If you're in the, here in this place, this is my plug for you that if you're here and you're not saved. If you don't know the love of Christ, this love comes by an encounter with him. Where as you make a decision to repent, to turn from your sin, to put your faith in Jesus Christ, you can have this encounter with God where you can meet him and he can show you his love, show you his grace, his mercy. This is what he wants to, sh this is an encounter with God called salvation, where we turn from our sins and put our faith and trust in him. So if you're here in this place and you don't know Jesus Christ, you can experience this love firsthand. That's the beauty of the gospel. Jesus wanting to have a relationship with you. That's my quick plug for you if you're here and you don't know Jesus. My testimony is when I got saved. Again, I, I was raised in church. Um, I was one of those ones that endeavored to do what was right. But 19 years old, I'd gotten into a relationship, and there was the, I'd allowed some failures within the relationship. And I remember it was, it was secret sin that I held on for a long time. But I remember when I confessed my sin to my dad. I remember I told him I confessed my sin to my dad, but ultimately what I was doing is I was confessing it before God. I remember even though I had heard the truth of the gospel for such a long time, it was in that moment that I experienced the grace of God for the first time. In a true and tangible way. All of a sudden, the gospel wasn't simply, a, 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 I heard Jesus loved me, and so because he loves me, he loves, I experienced it firsthand. That grace was almost tangible in that moment. And that's something that you can have as well tonight if you don't know Jesus. One of the things I want to look at, though, is I want to look at the Father's heart. There's a text that we know often. Uh, it's a text that we know and we reference often. For me, it's a text that's hit home, but it's Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates his, oh, his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. But think about that for a moment. While you and I were deep in our sin, deep in our rebellion towards God, living a life of self, living a life for yourself, indulging in whatever your flesh desired, when you were at the lowest point of your life, God says that's where he demonstrated his love. It wasn't as you were on the up and up, making decisions that you were going to get right, that God then said, okay, I will now demonstrate my love. It was while we were still sinners, deep, dead in our sin, that's where Christ showed his love for us. Why I say that is because here is God being the perfect example of what we're supposed to be. That as we see people deep in their sin, at the bottom of bottoms, where they're deep in their rebellion towards God. That's where we're supposed to love people. That's supposed to be where we have a heart of love for people. It's in that moment. They need to see that. They need to see that you have the love of Christ in you in that moment. That's where we struggle. If, if I'm being honest, that's where I struggle, right? I'll, I'll be personal here. It's in that moment. It's when you see people at their worst. Where most of us kind of go, I don't want to deal with that right now. I want to deal with that when they're, you know, tomorrow morning, when they're better, and they're, you know, maybe have a cleaner mind. That's when I want to deal with it, right? But no, it's in that moment that God demonstrated his love toward us, deep in our sin. And I love that God shows this to us. Obviously, we want to be imitators of Christ, Ephesians 5, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. As we, procre as we proclaim the goodness of Jesus and preach the gospel, we need to remember that we need to have a heart of love. That's what people need to see. We claim that we're Christians. But we need to be imitators of that exact love that God showed us. Lastly, I want to just finish with this, the need for this love. Again, talking about a dying generation. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't take long for any of us to just simply look out and see, see how far gone just even my generation. I graduated only 10 years ago. In 10 years, it's so incredible to see how much has changed. 
And in this day and age, what sinners need to hear and what sinners need to see is the love of Christ in us, that they can be forgiven of their sin, that they can experience the grace and the goodness of God. There's already a, hate, <laughs> there's already a lot of hatred in our day, right? They don't need to receive it from so-called Christians. They don't need to receive it. What they need to experience is they need to experience the preaching of the cross and that the judgment that God is ultimately going to pour out upon all sin, that they can escape that. They can be free from that judgment. That as they come and know Christ, they can experience the love and the goodness of Christ. And if we would be the Christians that God has called us to, the sons and daughters that God's called us to be and preach his goodness with love, that people can see that love in you and I. And through that, they can see the love of Christ. That's ultimately what we are after. I've always been so intrigued by, you know, that last encounter that Simon has with Jesus. John 21, 15, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of, Jonah, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to them, yes, Lord, you know I love you. He said, feed my lambs. He doesn't say that once. He says that three times. And I remember as I read that text recently, what I, what I heard God is God asked me, John Paul, do you love me? Love my creation. Love the people, the souls that I created. Love them. Got it, God. John, do you love me? Yes, God, you know I love you. Then love my people. Love the creation that I've put here on earth. Lost souls is what we're after, right? As a fellowship, that's been our MO. We're, we're contending for lost souls. And ultimately, if we make sure that we keep our heart right and have a continued love for people, we can see God then do the rest. And God save people, transform the hearts and lives of people. What we so desperately need today is for us as sons and God, daughters of, of God is, is we, need to be, we need to be lovers of this lost and dying generation. Amen. If I can have every head bowed, every eye closed in this place. Again, tonight I it, preach something very simple. But if you're here in this place and you don't know the love of Jesus, this love that I've been talking about, for you, that's, a, that's something foreign. You don't, it doesn't register to you. My friend, the beauty of the gospel is this. Jesus, like Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrates his love, own love toward us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for you, my friend. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've gone through, again, while you were deep in your sin, the lowest part of your life, if you're here and you're at that point, God loves you right there. And God wants to show you that love. But this comes as you make a decision to put your faith and trust in him and repent from your sin. As you make a decision to say, okay, God, I am going to surrender my life to you. I'm going to turn from my sin and put my faith and trust in you. God wants to show you his love, his grace, and his mercy. And that can be your portion tonight. It's the beauty of this gospel. Here, here tonight, and you want to receive Jesus. You want to know that love. And you want to lift up your hand tonight and say, I want to turn from my sin. I want to put my faith and trust in Jesus. You're here tonight. That's you. You want to lift your hand with no one looking around. Nothing to be ashamed of. Because ultimately, you can escape the judgment of your sin, which is death, hell, separation from God. You can escape that by making the decision to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, to have his blood wash over you, cover your sins, and be a new creation. Again, not going to hold it very long. If that's you in this place, and you want to know Jesus, simply raise your hand. Amen. We'll change in the order of service. Maybe you're here tonight and there was a time where you said, I once, I once was serving God, loving people, but I have walked away from that first love. I have walked away from that love in Christ, but tonight I want to make it right again. And I want to experience the love of God again, and you want to make it right. And you're here tonight, and you want to lift up your hand. Jesus wants to make himself real to you. He wants to show you his love. Again, last time, last call, if you're here and you want to know Jesus or need to repent again and make it right, you want to lift your hand. Praise God. Well, then
and again to change the order of service. What we're going to do is we're going to open the altar call. And if you're here and you want to lay hold of God, you want to make things right, or you want to bring whatever petition you have to God, the altars are now open. Please come, lay hold of God.
are bowed and our eyes are closed, how come I would expect John Paul Merlez to preach on love for a dying generation? Uh, maybe, maybe you don't get the joke. Amen. But see, I know him. I know his heart, and, and that's 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 what comes out. Amen. And the title of his message alone: "Love for a Dying Generation." God help us. Um, I do want to say that. This film series is just so impacting me. It just, on a daily basis, it's so impacting me that we saw for Sunday school this morning. And I, and I see the love that Jesus had for Nicodemus. I see the love that Jesus had for this strange character called Matthew the tax collector. And I'm telling you, that's helping me. It really is helping me. Amen. And, you know, we're, we're such, you know, we label people, but God loves all people. He loves all people. And God help us, amen, that, that we can do that. It's just show the love of God to a dying generation tonight. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. Let's be dismissed from this place. I'd like to ask my brother Josh Denny if he'd ask God's blessing as we leave.